So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Davida and I's talk about uh, building the community enterprise operating system through CentOS Stream. So, a little bit about us. Uh, I'm Neil, he's Davida. I'm Davida. We do stuff, lots of stuff. You can see there's plenty of bullets about the things that we do. Um, and uh, for the purpose of this talk, um, I'm involved in various SIGs in Fedora and CentOS. Uh, Neil and I share the CentOS Hyperscale SIG. I'm also a director on the CentOS board, and I'm a production engineer at Meta on the Linux user space team, uh, which, among other things, maintains the CentOS deployment on the fleet. Yeah, and then from my side, I do bunches of CentOS things as well as Fedora things. Um, but I'm also a member of KDEV and a co-host of the Pseudo Show podcast. And I do a lot of stuff in Fedora, CentOS, and other open source projects as, you know, working through my company, Velocity Limitless. <coughs> so, um, so we're going to go over a fairly quick and hopefully understandable <laughs> overview of how CentOS Stream came to be and where it fits into the picture uh, and what the various components are in the pipeline, where they come from and where the operating system comes from. Then we'll talk about more specifically the work we have been doing as part of the CentOS Hyperscale SIG within the CentOS project. And we'll close with a few words on how you two can get involved in this space. So, starting with CentOS Stream. So this is a chart that is very helpfully showing a view of how, you, how the integration pipeline from open source projects made by people on the internet come down to becoming eventually something that may exist in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So we're mostly focusing on bullet three here, which is CentOS Stream. Uh, now that's the picture of where we are now. That's not how it always was. So let's look back at how things looked like in the world when CentOS Linux 7 was a thing. CentOS Linux 7 was originally branched from Fedora 19. So we started from Fedora 19. Fedora 19 was released a very long time ago. I don't actually remember. 2012. When. It predates the start of my involvement in this ecosystem. <laughs> um, so within Red Hat, they took Fedora 19, they branched it into an internal staging distribution, which acted as kind of like a primordial soup. And within there, uh, employees and developers within Red Hat, the company, developed the distribution and ultimately released Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, uh, which was the thing you can buy. And then they released 7.1, 7.2, 7.3 as point releases of the 7 branch. Uh, independently, the CentOS Linux project would take the sources coming from RHEL and rebuild it and release CentOS Linux, uh, the distribution. So you would have CentOS Linux 7.0 that was roughly equivalent to RHEL 7.0 and then 1 and 2 and so on and so forth. Hey, Troy. Hello, Troy. Uh, now, uh, with 8, things changed slightly. Uh, so with 8, we started from Fedora 28. So that, that was more recent, obviously. Uh, Quite a jump. The air, I just noticed that the arrows are not visible at all, but this is supposed to be at least from there, in, yeah. in case the colors are... I think the colors are just not showing up yeah, on the projector. That's fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kind of blue. yeah they're, yeah, they're very light blue. That's all right. So Fedora 28, which came out in 20, uh, at the, at 2018. So we start from here, and then magic soup things happen, and CentOS Stream 8 becomes a thing. And uh, but in, the difference here is that CentOS Stream 8 is developed in the open, akin to Fedora. Right. So it is something that you can actually see and touch and work on, and there are repos on GitLab that you can look at. Uh, so that was an improvement, because it wasn't something that was just within the Red Hat firewall, but it was something outside. Then from Stream 8, RHEL, the product, came to be. And then out of RHEL, CentOS <laughs> Linux 8 was still being rebuilt. Uh, Exposed. Ish. Yeah. Uh, for a while. Yeah. Uh, then, if we look at the next one, with nine. We got uh, a new phase in the middle. We have a new phase in the middle uh, with Fedora ELN. So I was mentioning earlier the primordial soup. ELN is effectively the primordial soup. Uh, so what ELN is effectively is another distribution uh, that takes the contents of Fedora Rawhide, the Fedora development distribution, and every day takes Rawhide and Rebuild Throid as if we were making CentOS Stream, a new CentOS Stream major release today. So we get in, in progress updates of what the next CentOS Stream major release is going to look like. Uh, and so this started happening in 2021, just after Fedora 34 came out, that they took the soup and made CentOS Stream 9. 
Yeah, and then when, uh, when it's time to actually start the development cycle for a new straight major release, a nine in this case, ELN is branched, and then the connection is severed, and at that point, the development happens in stream, and ELN starts tracking the next major, uh, which is 10. Right now, we are at the phase, uh, I don't think we put up the chart, but right now we're at the phase where mm, the nine right. cycle is well, uh, well and done. Yeah. Uh, ELN has already been branched into 10, and ELN is currently tracking 11. Right. So we're already one step up in this cycle. Uh, and in this picture, we don't have CentOS Linux anymore, because CentOS Linux doesn't exist anymore. As a, as a deliverable of the project. Uh, so the, there are other projects that do rebuilds ex post, uh, but yeah. as part of CentOS, the only deliverable is three. Whoa. You went too yeah. far. Yeah, because I hit the big button instead of the small one. All right. There we go. So, so this is where you know, we talked about this, this pipeline of the process of how everything kind of comes to be from the CentOS to the RHEL to the, and the soup involved in the middle. So when we're talking about the soup, the soup is formed from the stuff that's in Fedora. So from the perspective of CentOS, the way we look at it is that it influences the next CentOS stream major release. Obviously, Fedora is much bigger than that. It does a whole lot more, and it is its own thing in its own right with its own community. But again, from the perspective of the badge that's in the bottom left corner of my presentation deck, this is what it, that's all that really matters about it. So the way that you kind of influence things going into the next major CentOS stream is by doing things in Fedora, advancing the technology and the community by engaging with fixing bugs, maintaining packages, and driving changes to make things better. Yeah. Dri driving changes in particular is a great way if you want to have a chance to influence policy and the content of the distribution down the road. And speaking of which, we did a pile of them. <laughs> uh, we have done a lot of changes over the years. Uh, yeah. We just updated these. There's probably a few missing. Oh, there's uh, definitely a few um, missing. But yeah, in Fedora 33, uh, we worked to uh, change the default file system of Fedora from Extended 4 to ButterFS. So as of Fedora 33, ButterFS is the default file system in Fedora. In 34, we enabled the standard compression by default uh, in ButterFS, um, which among other things improves uh, lifespan and performance on SSDs. Uh, also in 34, we ship system D UMD by default, uh, which gives you a way to have uh, better control on out-of-memory situations in user space before the kernel UM killer comes along. Um, it is Fedora Cloud. Yeah, so with Fedora 35, David over there in the audience and I, uh, we moved the Fedora Cloud images to ButterFS not because of the right amplification thing, but for a simple reason of being able to have a little bit more flexibility when people make their instances because ButterFS is, I think, the only file system where you can grow or shrink it live online while it's mounted, which gives you a ton of flexibility when you're trying to make things smaller and have a lot more instances without paying as much money and stuff like that. And there's a few other nice benefits, but that was a, that was a big driver. Um, and then with Fedora 36, we relocated the RPM DB from var to user. This is sort of a preparatory thing for being able to do some other stuff that, around like being able to do system snapshots coherently and stuff like that. Um, Fedora 37, we took a step towards this idea of being able to move towards a quote unquote legacy free uh, operating environment by using GPT. Uh, the, the type of disk formatting that you use on UEFI systems, even on legacy BIOS. We did fallback host name, and you want to talk about frame pointers? And in 38, uh, we landed a change to uh, enable frame pointers by default in the distribution. Uh, frame pointers is a compiler feature that lets you effectively be a useful backtraces. So when something crashes and you look at a backtrace, the backtrace actually makes sense. Um, they have a minor performance hit uh, that we, we did a lot of benchmarking and measurement and was mostly not statistically significant. Um, the other thing is enabled is doing continuous profiling uh, where uh, that's something we use at Meta, for example, where if you want to have good signal on what the system is doing at a large scale, you can run perf or the equivalent of perf continuously on the system and collect the data from it. And then especially if you have a lot of machine, this gives you a lot of interesting information. There's also a side of, an, another benefit of having the frame pointer stuff from the community perspective is that if you are interested in the Linux desktop and you want the Linux desktop to not suck in terms of performance, you would want to be able to see why your desktop sucks while you're running it. And it turns out 
There are not that many ways to do it in Linux unless you have frame pointers turned on. So for GNOME, you have sysprof. Yeah. And for KDE, you have hotspot. And those use frame pointers to be able to analyze the stack in real time to be able to see where you have bottlenecks while the, de the desktop environment is, is operating or applications are running. And like even in the last year alone, I think uh, GNOME through GTK and, a, and VT and a bunch of things like somewhere between five to seven fold uh, performance increases and like more than half of memory consumption cut because they were able to see these kinds of things and fix them because they can observe them in real time. And when users observe issues, they can just plug the instrumentation in and see what's going on and capture those reports and then and then analyze them later. Uh, this is something that desktop Linux developers and a lot of other people, like people in the cloudy spaces have already kind of known that this was a powerful trick, but everyone else didn't really know. And now this is a thing that you can do. This is available in Fedora. And if you didn't know this was a thing and you work on say desktop applications or databases or any of these other things, this is a very good trick to know. Yes. Um, by the way, these are all changes we landed in Fedora. You might notice that not all of these are things that you can find in RHEL right now. Uh, RHEL can make policies, decisions that deviate from Fedora. So for example, RHEL does not ship with ButterFS by default, although or it would very much like if it would. Yeah. Um, or um, RHEL 10, I believe, does not ship with frame pointers by default, despite being branched from 40. Um, well, who knows? Although RHEL, RHEL 11 might, we will yeah. see. Yeah, who knows? Um, uh, we also have a number of things in progress. Uh, the ones I listed here, uh, Michel sitting there is working on the firmware minimization, uh, which is the idea of taking the Linux firmware package, which is what, like three or 400 megabytes of mostly garbage. 800 and megabytes. Splitting it up in a more granular fashion so that say you don't have an, I don't know, an AMD GPU or a Broadcom wireless card or whatever. I hope you you don't maybe don't need the firmware installed for that. Um, also, we've been working more or less since Fedora 33, so for quite a while on uh, Copy on Write. Uh, Copy on Write is an enhancement to the RPM packaging suite uh, that Matthew originally wrote. Um, the idea is to leverage the Copy on Write features of the file system to make package operations more efficient, especially installation of packages, especially in image building context. These had a bit of a long and storied history, um, but it does exist and it does work, and we're hopeful we will be able to get it landed in the distribution in the future. So on top of the stuff that we do in, in Fedora, we also try to bring as much of the stuff that we work on into that, that doesn't make it into RHEL itself to still be available for CentOS and RHEL users through the extra packages for enterprise Linux. Um, as part of doing this work, we also have set up this um, packager SIG, Apple packager SIG, that streamlines the process for being able to, do, to bring these things in and helps provide collective maintenance, which is something that makes it a lot easier for us to support a wide range of crazy little packages and programs and things like that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And as part of that, Michelle here, again, you know, I'm going to keep shouting you out when you do cool stuff. He wrote this wonderful tool called eBranch, which makes it super easy to get through a whole stack of things and get them actually done in a reasonable time frame without, you know, crying. Yeah, among other things, <laughs> eBranch allowed us to branch hundreds and hundreds of Rust packages from Fedora into FL. Uh, and go would have been and go long, and th that would have been extremely unpleasant to do by hand. Um, another role that I want to mention that the package SIG has here is that we established a process that um, allows us to get content branched into Appel in a timely fashion, even if the maintainer of the corresponding Fedora package isn't interested in doing work in Appel. Because uh, before you were kind of hostage if the maintainer didn't really care about Appel. And now there's a process where we can still branch the package and maintain it without causing undue burden to the maintainer. Uh, and then we have ELN. Uh, we mentioned ELN before. ELN is a continuous rebuild of ROI using the CentOS macros at tool chain. So it gives you a point of view in time of what the next major will be. And it acts as an incubator, a system into the brink up of the new major release. Uh, you can run ELN now if you want. There are composers you can download. I run ELN on machines in production to get a sense of what is going to break when I have to do a major migration down the road. It works really well. Uh, there is a SIG uh, for ELN. It's called the ELN SIG. It takes care of the upkeep for the distribution, and it's generally the place to engage with. Uh, one of the things that the SIG worked on is ELN Extras. Uh, ELN Extras is a way for us to add additional packages into the ELN composes that aren't necessarily going to be part of uh, CentOS Stream NRL. Um, you can think of ELN Extra a bit akin to Appel, and in fact, there are 
a variety of plans involving using ELN extras as a way to seed the next Appel, or well, the Appel for the next uh, major release of Stream, which in this case will be Stream 10. For example, KDE Plasma, because everyone loves KDE and it's the best, but it's not included in RHEL. And so it's shipped in extra packages for Enterprise Linux since RHEL 8. And we want to also have it as early as we can uh, for Apple 10. So we seed uh, Elon with KDE and continuously check to make sure everything's going to be working. Yep. And there's um, we are in the process of building out a variety of testing infrastructure around ELN as well. There's already support for ELN in OpenQA. Uh, internally in Meta, as I mentioned, we're using ELN to get an idea of what's coming down the pipe and also to identify policy changes that might be coming. Uh, that's another thing that's really useful because you won't really know, unless you're paying attention to the day-to-day -day development, you probably won't know what's going to be new and different and scary in 10. Uh, but you can if you take a look at what happens in ELN. And now we talk about a little bit of the past with CentOS Stream 8. So as we mentioned earlier, CentOS Stream is continuously delivered, uh, tracking the next minor version. So this is not a rolling release. Don't think that. I know people on the internet have said it's a rolling release. It ain't. What it is, is essentially, a, if you think of more along the lines of, uh, you know, how a Debian or Ubuntu have these LTS releases, and they last for this extended period of time frame, and then they make a new release, and it's based on a new code base, a new code stream. The only difference between how it works for them versus us is that we don't do roll-up updates. So there are no point releases based on a roll-up updates. There are roll-up ISOs, they do get released, you can download them and use them, but that's not kind of the, that's not the important mm -hmm. part. But it is, you can file and fix bugs for it, you can send pull requests to fix things in it, and special interest groups can do things with it on time. Um, if you were familiar with CentOS Linux, you can think of Stream is effectively the same as CentOS Linux with the CR proposed updates repo enabled. It, that's effectively equivalent. Right. Um, and with the added advantage that you don't have to worry about point releases, which are, in my opinion, a pain to deal with if all you care is having the system up to date and you don't care about the point releases as synchronization points. Right. And if you look at CentOS Stream 9, mostly the same as what we just said for CentOS Stream 8, except for it's actively developed right now. It's a thing that is current and you can go look at it, you can go download it, and you can play with it, you can contribute to it, all the infrastructure stuff. Earlier today, Troy talked about the talked about this stuff in the context of like, how do you see it, how is it open, and it has more details on it. Check out, uh, check out the recording if you weren't there for that. Or if you are here afterwards or during or whatever, go bug Troy, he's here in the audience. Uh, the, I, I just noticed the, the slides were originally written when Stream 8 was developed on Git the CentOS and on the old Koji instance and Stream 9 on GitLab. These days, everything happens on GitLab and everything happens in the Stream instance. And so, we don't do Bugzilla anymore, so, so the, my eternal sadness. The, data, the information here is the more accurate one and we need to update this slide. Yeah. Um, but yeah, both distributions are developed on GitLab and if you go on GitLab the CentOS, on GitLab Red or CentOS Stream, for each package in there, there are branches for each distribution. So you see C8S, C9S, and as of a few weeks ago, C10S branches tracking the various distributions, and that's where you will see commits happening whenever there's a change. And then if you go on that Koji instance, that's where you will see builds happening for every package in the distribution. And for every build that happens, if you drill down, you will see that the build can be in various stages. Oftentimes a build will be engaging, but will not be published yet because it's being tested. And then when it's published, it gets a C9 released tag. Yep. And that's when it starts showing up in Composes. And if you do DNF update on your machine, you will see it there. Speaking of Composes, Composes are the daily snapshots of the distributions. Uh, you can find them on yeah. that URL. Troy also talked about Composes yep. earlier. Yep. Uh, also point out, you don't use Red Hat Bugzilla for CentOS Stream 8, 9, 10, or 11. Well, 11 doesn't uh, exist yet, but you don't use... You, uh, yes. You, it is the Red Hat Jira now. It, this moved to Jira, yes. Bugzilla is still used for Fedora, though, and it is yeah. still used for Appel to make things more confusing. Yes. But, um, but yes, Jira Sadness is now... Yes, there, there is a Jira instance uh, which works about the same where the project, the project names are the same and the version is the same. It, yeah. it is Jira, so it is, in my opinion, significantly more unpleasant to use, but your mileage yeah. may vary. Um, uh, there are people in the world who love Jira. Next up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so this is some of the stuff that we've done 
um, to make CentOS Stream 9 better. Uh, and some of this stuff you might not have known that we did because it happened before CentOS Stream 9 was quote unquote released. Uh, so for example, uh, Davida here did the systemd umd stuff and I d made a way to package Nginx modules, which was a lot of work, but there you go. You can now have custom Nginx modules and you don't have to hurt yourself figuring out how to deliver them because my gosh, the way you build Nginx modules sucks. Um, Pipewire with Wire Plumber and Jack, so you got the Pro Audio stuff, and Wayland for all the things, and some other random tools and stuff. Uh, yeah, there was an update for Istool uh, that was needed for some hardware enablement. Uh, we also did a fair bit of work uh, on the kernel live patching infrastructure that I forgot to put on this slide. Uh, there's a lot. We forget yeah. more than we have. Next. Uh, and I understand. So as we mentioned, 10 is in active development now. It has been branched uh, off ELN uh, around, around the time when Fedora 40 released. You can find CTNS branches already on GitLab, and if you go on Koji, you can see CTNS builds. There are composites of 10 available that may or may not boot. Uh, if you do. try them now, do they boot now? Oh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, oh, they so are, the, X, the XFS thing was fixed, right? They are, however, not signed yet. Uh, the packages aren't signed yet. Uh, but I am told signed composites will be coming soon. Real um, soon now. Uh, development for 10, to be clear, is not officially open, uh, but it is there, and you can see it, and you can file bugs and sample requests if you want, uh, with the understanding that things are still changing quite a bit. And for example, there's a lot of packages that are still in the wrong place, uh, or that may be removed, or that may be added. So uh, things are going to shift, the sands are shifting quite a bit still at this stage. Yeah, nobody's put any water on the sand to make it mud yet. So, yeah. you know, there you go. All right. Uh, now we're enough. the fun part. That's enough for Santos. Let's talk about what we do with SIG. Uh, All right. All right, I'll do the intro. Uh, the Hyperscale SIG is a central special interest group uh, that we started uh, a few 21, years ago now. January 21. 21? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been a while. It has been a while. Um, the idea was to have a place uh, where uh, different players in this space could work together uh, on deploying CentOS in large scale environments. We found that there were pretty much everyone that was deploying CentOS at large scale ended up sort of reinventing the wheel and having to solve the same problems. We felt there was room for having a space for people to collaborate here. Um, this is the, it's also that a lot of companies that work here tend to build tooling around the distributions, and they always stay behind closed doors. And we wanted a place where this could be published out in the open and different players could cooperate. Um, I mentioned companies, but this isn't reserved to companies. It's open to anyone that wants to participate. Hi. Uh, I happen to work at <laughs> Meta, so I do this with my Meta hat. Neil does not work at Meta. And Neil definitely does not. Yeah, Neil does not work uh, at Meta. Uh, we have <laughs> folks. Uh, we have folks from Twitter, from Intel, um, uh, from Amazon, from a number of companies that work on this. Uh, we have meetings on Matrix that you are welcome to join if you would like. Uh, we also generally just hang out in that room uh, where you are welcome to stop by and ask questions. Next slide, please. Um, this is actually the largest part of what we do in yeah. the hyperscale sig so this is um we, we t because of the way that the various aspects of the centos ecosystem work um if you need to update packages that exist in rel you really don't have a place to put them normally and so this was actually the starting point for the hyperscale sig was to take those things that you know companies were doing or people were doing independently on their own of maintaining their own backports and putting them in a more collective location that people could, everyone could benefit from. Uh, and, and also, you know, over time, this evolved into a, sort of a staging ground to be able to see if we could get things um, updated in the core CentOS stream distribution. So some of these things, like there's a ton of packages here, some of these have actually been yeah. updated in CentOS stream after we've done it in hyperscale to see that everything is yeah, fine-ish. This work started before, uh, I would say at a time when CentOS was still very reticent to do uh, version rebases of packages. So if a package was a version X, it would likely be a version X throughout the life of the distribution. And in more recent years, we've seen maintainers be more willing to consider rebasing packages, even core packages like systemd. Um, systemd got rebased twice and, during CentOS Stream 9. Uh, so, mm, so that has been nice because we've been able to delete a lot of packages from here. And that is a random selection. The one on the slide is not, is not at all uh, complete. Uh, if you go on CBS, CBS is the Koji instance that we use uh, for SIG work. You can see the list of packages that are available now. Uh, and if you happen to have a CentOS machine, you can just get these by doing DNF install. Um, 
send us release hyperscale, which will give you the repo definition for this repo. Uh, all of the packages we ship in this repo are meant to be dropping replacements, so they should work out of the box and not make things worse. Uh, I mean, there are always bugs, so if they do make things work, uh, worse, please let us know. Um, one thing, a final thing I wanted to call out is that we are working uh, from the meta side on an updated OpenSSH package there. Uh, we we're hoping to collate a lot of the community patches around OpenSSH that for one reason or another have been challenging to get upstream into OpenSSH. Uh, so we can hopefully have a better, have a better place for doing that work. Uh, that is not published yet. Uh, one of the main things we maintain in hyperscale is a system is a backward of systemd and that was actually one of the reasons why uh, with my meta hat on we were interested initially in doing this work uh, we do a lot of work on systemd and we wanted to be able to uh, get the work that we were doing in systemd upstream available in the distribution as quickly as possible so we have a backward of systemd that tracks the latest systemd stable uh, right now i think we're at 255 yep um, that landed just a week ago or uh, so this is this roughly the same system D that you would find in Fedora feature wise. Uh, so it has secret two by default, uh, which is the default on nine, but wasn't the default on eight. It ships uh, all of the ancillary demons that are disabled in RHEL. So it will ship things like OOMD, NetworkD, and ResolveD, and all of those. You don't have to use them, but they are available if you want to use them. And for example, we happen to use NetworkD at Meta, for example, for networking. Uh, there is a repo that you can see uh, where we stage patches. We will occasionally backward patches from systemd stable. Uh, this actually tracks systemd stable, to be clear, and not systemd uh, tip. Um, but the difference isn't meaningful unless you do active development on it. Um, the, we also have a comp build system based on GitLab pipelines where every day it will take for every uh, change that happens in the systemd main repo, it will rebuild the packaging and run the test suite so that we get immediate alerts if something happened in system D upstream that would break things in the distribution before we unleash it to the world. Um, and you can help. There is actual documentation for this, which is rare. Yes, um, we wrote docs. Uh, we did write, well, Dan wrote documentation. Well, uh, and yes. Anita. Dan and Anita wrote documentation for this, so if you would like to help or use this or do interesting things with it, uh, it is mostly understandable. I hope so. Yeah, it should be fine. So the virtualization stack, we maintain some backports of uh, the virtualization stack. This is mostly one of those things where a large part of it is that we just need things slightly sooner than when it gets rebased in by Red Hat. So some in originally when we started doing this with CentOS Stream 8, the, the virtualization stack was frozen and we definitely need newer stuff. Um, sometime towards the end of Stream 8 and into Stream 9, they changed it and they now regularly rebase it. And so now the main reason that we do this is to turn on features that got turned off. So for example, SPI support, uh, VertIO GPU, 9PFS, uh, stuff like that that you need for being able to do sharing between host and guests and all the other fancy integration stuff. And we try to keep track following um, Fedora Mainline. And so the latest stable releases we track those, and we try to we try to judge basically between how far ahead can we go without everything breaking, and whether and how we can handle it relative to what Red Hat's going to do with their stack rebases to kind of keep things from breaking. Because the virtualization stack is intertwined, but also a bunch of things depend on it, and we want to make sure everything slots in quite nicely. It's currently in testing. We haven't really released no, new we, stuff we, recently. We haven't released it mostly because it needs actual production testing, which um, at least on my end, we haven't had a chance to do yet. Mm -hmm. um, we have made a point though of doing all of this work in Fedora. Uh, the maintainers on the Fedora side have been really helpful on this. So uh, we were able to push all of the changes we had to make for enablement on the central side, on Fedora, on the Fedora side. Um, so if and when this is rebased in RHEL, they'll get those for free, which right. is very nice. Uh, so this one is actually one of the more interesting things where we wind up uh, serving a bit as an incubator for cool improvements that landed eventually into mainline CentOS. Um, we, Intel folks came into the CentOS project and needed a place to, to try to show off some of their new stuff that they're working on to provide better performance on x86 systems with, uh, with Zlib and some glibc features and stuff like that. So this was brought in from Intel uh, into the CentOS Hyperscale SIG, and so we had a Hyperscale Intel uh, branch, so to speak. And that stuff uh, evolved over time, and then eventually um, it was accepted and merged into CentOS Stream 
eight and nine, and it also became the progenitor of the Centos Isasig, which is around the idea of testing CPU optimization improvements, porting to new architectures, that sort of thing. And that's where a lot of that stuff kind of lives now. So this was one of those success stories of bringing in a new stakeholder into the community and then them becoming big and confident in their, in their engagements to be able to you know, do their own effort here. Yeah. Uh, another example of work that we were able to do in the SIG early on that then ended up showing up in RHEL itself, um, we needed an updated version of LLVM and uh, to make things more fun at the time, LLVM used modularity. Oh. Uh, mm. If you're not familiar with modularity, that's for the best. Yep. Uh, it is gone, so you don't have to think about it. Um, but what we ended up doing was be doing non-modular builds of LLVM within hyperscale and work with the maintainers of LLVM in RHEL to test and qualify and make sure that the things that they cared about and that we cared about would be in good shape. And then this ended up landing in RHEL 8.5 proper and we were able to drop it from hyperscale itself. Uh, and there's links there to the upstream. There was an actual bug in LLVM proper um, that was involved here, which made things fun. Mm. Uh, the other things we do in hyperscale is so far we've talked mostly about new packages or new updated versions of packages, but another thing we do is ship packages that uh, might have uh, policy deviation or configuration deviations. Uh, so an example early on was IP tables where in stream, <coughs> uh, instead of Linux 8 and in stream 8 uh, only had um, the NF tables backend, uh, but for a variety of reasons at Meta we needed uh, to be able to use the legacy backend. So we shipped a version of IP tables with that backend enabled and that, um, and that acted as a drop-in replacement. So if you were using NF tables, nothing changed for you, but you also had the ability to use the legacy backend. Uh, for nine, we were able to do this in Appel, uh, which was a much cleaner, cleaner way to do it. Oh yeah. Uh, and for what it's worth, we try to put things into Apple first before, yeah. it, and, and try to make it more shared and more useful before putting it into, into the SIG space because that's just the way we wanted to, we want to try to maximize the benefit for the community. Yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier the RPM cow work that we're doing. Um, this is something that is actually deployed in production at Meta. Uh, and it is deployed from that repo. Uh, we use a separate repo, so this isn't delivered as part of the same uh, of the production hyperscale uh, repos, because both because it's in active development and you you might not want it, especially if you don't use ButterFS as your file system. Um, but it's, it's also not the kind of thing that you can just DNF install. Uh, well, you can, but it's not just a single package. It is the entire packaging stack. So it's RPM and DNF and LibrePo and all of that. Um, so it is available as a dedicated repository, and we use that repository called Experimental occasionally for other uh, things that aren't quite ready yet or are in active development. Um, but it does work. I happen to run this at home too, and it works fine. Well, uh, so the kernel is also another thing that we replaced. So previously, we were deriving our kernel based on the CentOS stream kernel and turning on a couple of features, but over time that became... Um, Difficult is the, the word I will use for this. Uh, difficult being working on a kernel that has been released three years ago and trying to enable features that were released only a few months ago uh, is very hard, uh, uh, with a capital H hard. Uh, so uh, I stopped doing that because I don't like pain that much. So uh, we removed to following uh, Fedora and rebasing onto the stable kernels as Fedora does it. And so basically when they pass their test weeks and they've decided to promote it to being released to as a stable release, I come back and take this back into, uh, into CentOS Hyperscale. And so we build, uh, we have a tree on GitLab for this. We build it for CentOS Stream 9. It is also going to continue for CentOS Stream 10 once we have CentOS 10 Hyperscale. Um, the primary thing we do is we add Butterfest support, but we also enable some other features um, that come in from that the people use in Fedora on their workstation or in the cloud or in the server that you know maybe Red Hat hasn't decided to turn on yet or, or they have decided not to turn on or whatever. Like one example of this is the binder FS support so that you can use Waydroid on, on, a, CentOS, on a CentOS hyperscale machine. Um, Secure Boot is, is still outstanding. So this, if you use UEFI, you basically can't use this if you have Secure Boot turned on because we don't have certificates. That's still ongoing, waiting for Infra work, and that's why this is in the experimental yep. repo. It works, it's fine, but 
I don't really want to promote it to the stable repo or really a dedicated kernel repo because I don't think yeah. I want to put it in the stable repo until we have secure boot worked out because I really would like people to not have to futz around with the BIOS to make their make their computers work. Hopefully this year. Yeah, I'm yes. crossing my fingers. Um, so as part of doing this CentOS work, both when we were originally working off the CentOS Stream 9 kernel based on 5.14, and even now when I'm working on it based on the Fedora kernel, so we've done some collaboration work with them to, to improve things. So we updated the standard uh, and had it track the latest thing from 5.16 at the time. We've turned on some of the crypto functions to make it possible to build a, a ButterFS kernel module uh, out as a kernel module outside of it for the CentOS Kmod SIG, which is another special interest group that works on building kernel modules for features that Red Hat doesn't ship in their standard kernel. Um, we have a contribution guide for the kernel, you know, and I even wrote it. So, yes. and, and based on how I do things. So, you know, if, if it doesn't make sense to you, then I'm sorry, it's my fault, but you can at least ask me and we can figure it out. Um, but the Kmod ButterFS that exists now from the Kmod SIG is is that one of the outcomes of this collaboration work? Yeah, and to be clear, Kmod ButterFS is something you can use if you run the stock RHEL kernel. So it allows you to leverage ButterFS as an effectively as if it were an out-of-three kernel module if you happen to be running the, RHEL kernel, the stock CentOS or RHEL kernel. Right. Because uh, Kmod targets RHEL as well, in yeah. addition to stream. Right. So, of course, related to the kernel stuff, we have to have the user space and implement because there's no real point in doing all that stuff if you can't really use it. Um, so at least from my perspective, my point of view, the ButterFS stuff, um, I backport ButterFS products from Fedora. It's currently at actually 6.8 now, not 6.7, but that's fine. Um, we have comp size so that because we use compression and so you want to be able to see the comparative sizes based on that. And I forked the entire Anaconda stack so that we have ButterFS stuff restored and we build the packages that include that for a dedicated spin repo for the media. And it's for the hyperscale spin, which we will talk about in a bit. And then Davida, you yep. want to talk about uh, the K-patch stuff? On, on another thing we worked on is that, that I mentioned earlier is kernel live patching. Uh, CentOS Stream and RHEL ship um, what I would call a neutered version of kernel live patching in that they ship the tooling to apply kernel live patches, but not the tool to create them. Uh, so as part of Hyperscale, we have an, a modified build of K-patch that includes the part that allows you to actually build these live patches. Uh, we also backported support uh, for work that was happening upstream to enable PGO optimizations when building the kernels with Clang, um, which, long story short, is something that allows you to have um, faster, uh, some things get faster and you have better optimization if you do specific builds. Uh, but the main thing is the fact that you can build these patches yourself, so if you happen to maintain your own kernel and want the ability to do live patching, you can do it. Did we turn on live patching for our kernel? It's, it's always turned on. Oh, it is? Uh, like we don't build live patches for our kernel because nobody has asked and sure. it's also not the most pleasant thing to do I, in the I, world, I don't, but Yeah, I don't like paying that can. much. Um, but if someone likes paying that much to make live uh, patches, it, it sure. can make It can make a lot of sense for like CVEs yeah. uh, and like point in time fixes. It's probably not something you want to do for major changes. Uh, yeah, and live patching also, like, it's important to note that with kernel live patching, that it is not meant to be the final solution. You are supposed to actually still apply a real kernel update and reboot yeah, eventually. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a way to get changes out faster. Right. But that's about it. Uh, we also have container images. We have container images that are that use the hyperscaler repos and packages, so if you want to display with these, they're published on Quay. They are built from scratch. They're supposed to be automatically published, but I think the CI is broken right now. Yeah. Um, mostly because I don't know how OpenShift works. Uh, you can get them uh, from Quay, however, uh, both for 8 and for 9. Uh, these uh, do not inherit from the uh, official containers for CentOS for reasons. Uh, <coughs> but you can find on that repo the Docker file we use to build them. Um, is uh, they're built from they use the like uh, build up from nothing flow so they're built from an empty uh, from an empty system. We might replace that with Kiwi at some point. That might make things easier. Yeah, maybe. So uh, we also make live media spins. So we have two CentOS Stream Nine spins with GNOME and KDE Plasma. We build with Kiwi using descriptions uh, using Kiwi descriptions in the CentOS Community Build Service CBS. Uh, you can see there's a link to the repo where they are. This is a collaboration with the CentOS Alternative Image SIGs. Hi, Troy. 
<laughs> Stop being asleep. Hi. Sorry. Please put me to sleep. <laughs> oh, wow. Ouch. Um, the live DVD ISOs with hyperscale repo and packages. It leverages our kernel. It also includes things like the RPM cow yes. stuff. So this is essentially our vision of a fully integrated CentOS hyperscale uh, thing. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's also a nice way if you just want to play with this without much commitment. You can put the live image in a VM or on a spare system and play around. Right. Um, and this is mostly targeting nine, to be clear. We used to have uh, spins based on eight. Um, they were painful. Uh, they I, are not really a thing anymore. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, for eight, I had to build them on my laptop and then upload them to an S3 bucket and then make yeah. sure the S3 bucket worked and then make it show up somewhere so people could download it. And it was all done by hand on my computer, and that sucked. Yeah, and I don't I'm, want to do that. I'm tearing down that AWS infra now, so we need to archive those somewhere. Yeah. Uh, next up. Uh, all right. Let's talk about what you also can do. So there's a blog that CentOS has where we try to publish updates. Uh, we publish quarterly updates on SIG activities. We also try to generally have project level updates. So you should read that if you're interested. There is a mailing list, which that is hopefully the right address. It is now. I fixed um, it. Uh, we have meetings, and most of the six uh, in CentOS hold somewhat regular meetings. There's a calendar that you can look at if you're interested. You, if you're interested in joining a SIG or starting your own SIG, uh, the wiki, which does not exist anymore, but that link should go, still go somewhere useful, has information on that. You can report bugs on Bugzilla or on Jira um, for uh, the things that are on Jira. You can maintain packages in Appel if you would like. You can contribute to Fedora. Uh, we also Go to a lot of conferences and give a lot of talks. Hi. Uh, so you can find those on that link. It's probably missing the last few months because we haven't updated okay. it in a while. Yeah, um, we need to do that. But that's like. Uh, but if down. you're if you're interested in a deep dive on some of the things we touched on in this talk, there is probably a talk already. Yep. It. And if not, just join our matrix room and, and yep. we can we can have conversations there too. Yeah, we are mostly um, based on U.S. time. So if you join uh, from Europe, that might that you might not get an immediate response, but we'll get to it eventually. And I think that's it. Any questions? I think we're good with time. Are, are we good with time? I think so. It's too early. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. We did good. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So my question is more about uh, speed. Mm -hmm. I can see you, know, you have a lot of speed here. But how do you keep the bad guys out of your distribution? Same way everybody else does by making sure that we we keep track of what's going on and and just being mindful of things. So not everybody can do builds of packages that get released to the world. So in, in, in the SIG specifically, you have to be a member of the SIG to be able to issue builds. Um, to and be a member of the SIG, the people in the SIG have to vote for you to join. Uh, this is a pretty small group, I would say, so it tends to be a fairly close-knit affair. Um, the things that go into CentOS proper are reviewed um, by the maintainer on the Red Hat side. And actually, you can't push two repos that go into CentOS itself. You have to go through the repos on GitLab. You can send pull requests, but they have to be merged by the maintainer that works for Red Hat. Um, now, none of this prevents somebody that's dedicated enough into sneaking something in, as we all know. Uh, it's just a... It's a fact of life. You have to take a defense in depth approach in all of these things and figure out what your threat model is and what you can do to mitigate it. Uh, there's not really a generic answer to this. Yeah. I and mean, for what it's worth, right, like we're, we keep track of all these things just like everybody else for the stuff that we ship. Most of the things were actually close to the upstream projects in question. So they know us, we know them, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, working closely with upstream helps a lot in this, in this setting. That is going to not be hey. fun. You're yes. Um, What's your philosophy of using CentOS Stream 9 or upcoming 10 as a, in a production environment? Is, are, is, it, is this production ready for the public to smash and crash? I mean, I run it in production on millions of machines that matter, okay. and it's fine. I run it on a computer. <laughs> um, okay. No, like, joking aside, uh, I would say it, it's, it's definitely fine. It's about the same level of production that you could have expected before we sent us Linux. It gets the same QA, the same, it goes through the same pipelines and the same infrastructure that the things that go into RHEL go. Uh -huh. So it's about the same level there. Well it works. does get, uh, some security fixes will get into RHEL sooner because of embargoes. 
So if you if you are not um, if you are not on VendorSec and you need to have CV fixes as quickly as possible, uh -huh. you may you may want to think about it and think whether that's okay for your use case. Uh, but that's the only thing that I would say could be a concern. Uh, What's the benefit to go to the next step, which is the rail? I mean, with Rail, if you have a problem, you can pay Red Hat and they'll fix it for you. Sure. Stream is self-supported, like Fedora or like any other community distribution. So if you, if you have a problem with it, you can ask nicely and people will, on the internet will probably help you. Or you can try to fix it yourself, or you can hire someone to provide you support, but mm -hmm. mostly the idea is that you would self-support, um, which is what we do for what is worth. Stream also only has five years of Yes, that is a good point. Yeah. Um, if you need long-term life cycle, if you need, uh, if you need qualification for vendor, yeah. say if you're on proprietary software that happens to need to be qualified against very specific versions of a distribution, yeah. then you probably want to use RHEL and target point releases. Okay. Or use another distribution that has point releases. If you, uh, if you don't care about that, I personally prefer the model without point releases because point releases are kind of a pain. Um, but it has its benefit if you, have, if you need synchronization points. The other thing to think about here is um, it also depends on how much you're willing to lie to your vendor that says that they need point releases. Um, <laughs> uh, hey, I am not a yes. it, 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 If a vendor particularly says that, hey, we are CentOS 9. Dot some, uh, they, or, or Red Hat Enterprise Linux like 9.2 or whatever, and because you know how... Red Hat Enterprise Linux is developed and built because you saw Troy's talk. You know that everything afterwards is also going to be fine, and this is really not a big deal. You could also just use it and then just not tell them that you're using it on a newer thing. And when you have, just don't tell them that you're on something newer, and they probably aren't going I to mean, know. Yes. Um, <laughs> this depends on what you're, exactly. Yeah. Um, Unless you're horrible, uh, yes. This can also get your support contract invalidated. So yeah. I would, uh, no, the other thing where you can, you may want to look at a commercial distribution is if you need certification for things yeah. like FIPS um, or, yeah. or other things that require government I a, stamps. I have a variety of CentOS versions running <coughs> publicly accessed servers. I haven't run into any problems. I'm just hearing words that CentOS stream might not be a production environment. I, so, I mean, uh, indemnity the indemnity doesn't come with with uh, CentOS, right? That's one of the things that you might want to consider. Yeah. So it, my, they are the same bits at the end of the day. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> my joking aside earlier about how much you want to lie to your vendor, the truth of it is like if you are using CentOS or RHEL or some whatever that's in the Red Hat family you're probably looking at a distribution that does more or less the same thing, that has more or less the same stuff and can run the applications for it. So it's really a question of, do you need it to have a, a stamp from a particular supplier? Do you need it to have a stamp from a particular agency? Or do you need uh, to have a stamp that says that this is a particular, that you've got a warranty, right? So one of those three questions to answer to your, as to, needs to be answered for you. And if the answer is yes for any one of those three, then that sort of makes your choice for you. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, CentOS Stream is perfectly fine for a production environment. I use CentOS Stream Hyperscale for all of my LTS-ish server things. I mean, I'm also a weird case because actually most of my servers are Fedora servers rather than rather than CentOS, but it works fine. I have a couple of, I have like two laptops and like four mini PCs that run on it and it, it, it works fine. Yeah. Michelle. Uh, one thing to note with the classic CentOS is that many people are not aware that the older point releases are not actually supported at all. So you might be saying, I'm on CentOS 8.8, 8.6, say like uh, that had 8.6 still supported, I'm fine, right? No, because the CentOS project never maintained anything but the latest series. Yeah. So in CentOS 3, you don't have that false yeah. sense of security. Yeah, you don't have point releases. Uh, the point releases. Well, also, if you're still on CentOS Linux, you really need to. Do oh, something. Be somewhere also, else because yeah. CentOS Linux doesn't exist anymore. As of June. Got, I, was gonna say, I mean, yeah, you still have a month, but <laughs> yeah, you, I, you, I would. You, it should be practically gone now. Um, no, you're right. CentOS Linux 7 still exists for the yeah. next month, but yes. Think about your life choices. 8 is gone. Eight yeah. Is gone, yeah. Eight, 8 has been gone for a while. Yeah. 
And if you're on Streamate, Streamate will be gone in, in, in at May. the end of the month. Yeah, end of May. Yes. Uh, yes. Because uh, the quirk of life. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, just a, another random question. You talked a lot about butter FS things. Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion about supporting ZFS a little bit stronger? No. So the problem with ZFS is, as you might be aware, ZFS is a complicated licensing situation. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, that makes it impractical to have ZFS supported in the mainline kernel. Okay. Now, one could, if they wanted, uh, build ZFS as an out of three module and support that. Uh, I'm pretty sure nobody would object if someone wanted to start a SIG to maintain that yeah, as no. part of CentOS, but that it's is not allowed. Not, in, it's not allowed in CentOS. Uh, yeah, it would be an interesting discussion, I think. It, uh, it we definitely a, cannot have it as part of the kernel itself. It has been asked, it is not allowed. Oh, okay, then. The answer is firmly no. Oh. <laughs> then that's not gonna happen. I mean, I, you, um, you, you can just add a repo that has yeah. ZFS yeah. in it. The OpenZFS project already provides packages for CentOS Stream as well yes. as Red Hat Enterprise Linux yeah. and Fedora. So if you want ZFS on those platforms, yeah. there, there are no technical limitations. This is purely yeah, we, legal we bullshit. Do it. I'm just wondering if there's going to be more uh, closer cooperative partnership with getting ZFS in the distribution. That seems unlikely unless the licensing situation gets sorted out, uh, which, which you would need to ask Oracle about. And and yeah. Anything else? Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Uh, oh, yeah, no, you're still here. So, yeah, I'm still uh, here. And you can keep the clicker. So. Yep, already. Well, because you're still here. Yes. Well. Maybe. Maybe.